and I shall listen. Uh, which are qualities that we should all have uh, in all fields of life. Uh, but I'm going to start by turning to the second part of the book as a political journalist, and we'll start the journey from there. Uh, since I am also in the presence of two congressmen, in a sense. <laughs> and I sometimes wonder, and I think I asked this to Mr. Prabhu during our interview and interaction, is the reason for writing the book? Is it the Congress's attempt to reclaim Hinduism also an admission at some level that the Congress has failed over the years to define what religiosity means? And since, Dr. Karan Singh, you are a product in a way of the Nehruvian age, is it also a reflection in a sense of the failure of Nehruvian secularism? The idea that Nehru had of the space and place of religion in modern society and in our political discourse. Do you see in Shashi Tharoor's book an attempt being made to reclaim Hinduism, but also somewhere an admission of the failure of the Congress of Nehruvian secularism? Typical of Rajiv to bring in the Congress and, and Nehru this party. He's one of our best anchors. He knows just how to trigger a, a debate. Let me first of all say that although this event is billed as the launch of Shashi Tharoor's book, it has been at the top of the bestseller list for the last six weeks and is now coming into a second edition. So I don't know how they can call it a launch, but David, for some reason, wanted to call it a launch, so that's what it says. Let me begin with also saying what a splendid book. <coughs> I entirely agree with what David Dabeda says. It is a book that should be read by all thinking people in India and abroad, regardless of whether they are Hindus or not. Because it encapsulates in many ways. It articulates the fundamental principles, if you like, the fundamental ideals of, of Hinduism. And points out, as Shashi has done in his, in his brilliant introductory remarks, the, the tremendous uh, uh, openness and inclusiveness of, of, uh, of Hindus. Now, um, Rajdi wants to begin with, with uh, Nehruism. Nehru I, I, I want to begin with an admission of failure. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, uh, I don't think that is, that is true at all. If you read the discovery of India, you will find that Jawaharlal Nehru has heaped great praise on the Upanishads, on Adi Shankaracharya, on, on various other uh, great Hindu leaders. So it is not as if Jawaharlal Nehru was anti-Hindu. Of course, he had his own views. Uh, I, I don't uh, personally subscribe to his. He was my guru and my mentor. But I have my own views on Hinduism. I'm not bound by what he thought about it. He didn't think too much about religion. He tended to uh, feel that because of the partition, and the horrors that, that uh, followed partition, it was better not to uh, articulate or not to impress too much upon the religious factor. And there's one point I, I did make to, to Shashi. The one thing that he's, he's perhaps left out is the partition and the trauma of partition, particularly in North India. And the fact that what North India went through, what Punjab and JNK went through and Bengal went through, and the reaction to that, it is astounding that despite all that trauma, which is unbelievable, I mean, there were, there were a million people killed, there were 10 million people uprooted from homes, and yet our constitution makers, after that terrible event, gave us a constitution that ensured equal respect and faith. You know, for all faiths and all religions. I think that is one of the most remarkable events in human history. That a country divided on the basis of hatred and, and intolerance should nonetheless not only not adopt a Hindu constitution, but go out of their way, bend over backwards to ensure that the uh, minorities receive full protection. So I think that a great deal of credit needs to go to Jawaharlal Nehru and the Congress leadership at that time. So the impression that the Congress had given up Hinduism and now is reclaiming it, I don't think that's really a fair thing to do. I mean, I've been talking about religion uh, for long before I came, came into, into, into public life and I continue to do so. So I know what Rajdeep is trying to say. This is not an electoral manifesto. It is not something which is, 
which is uh, pointed towards the elections in Karnataka or wherever. This is a book, and I, I'm astounded as to how Shashi, who leads such an active public life, he chaired our external affairs committee in the most excellent manner, how he found the time to do this sort of research that has gone into the book. It's not a casual book. He's, he's read his texts, he's, he's read his, his, uh, his, his background material, and he's presented it. So I think we should look upon this not only as an admission of failure, but a restatement of the final triumph of Hinduism. Can I just echo that, Sanandip, mm -hmm. since, uh, since I suppose the question was directed at both of us. I mean, first of all, indeed, you, you have to exempt Dr. Karan Singh from that charge because he was publishing books on Hinduism and speaking about Hinduism throughout his time in public life. And I think even head of a body called the Virat Hindu Samelan at one point, I remember, which, uh, which as a congressman uh, might have seemed incongruous to some, but I think was entirely of a piece with, with Nehruji's respect in many ways for faith. I mean, I think our secularism was not, I mean, secularism was actually a misnomer. Uh, when you think of secularism in a Western dictionary, it always implies the absence of religion, a distance from religion. But what Nehruji himself frequently explained was that secularism in India was about accepting all religions and ensuring the state didn't privilege any one of them, but that all could flourish. So in fact, what we really had under the name of secularism was pluralism. And, uh, and I think that that pluralist philosophy not only is not irrelevant and has not failed, but is the only viable way <coughs> to keep India together. If, if, if these folks succeed uh, in, for example, amending our constitution to make us Hindu Rashtra, they will not find it possible to keep India together. They will be the most horrendous, horrendous uh, reaction across the country. And I think that's the danger of their approach by comparison with what you've described as the Nehruvian approach. So I would argue with Dr. Karanjian, this book has nothing to do with contemporary politics. In any case, it was submitted, the manuscript was submitted to David before Rahul Gandhi started visiting temples in Gujarat. <laughs> uh, and, and I think you know, he was quite right to do so as part of his campaign. But my book really is not, is not linked to that. I hope that some of the things uh, in this book will outlast even the next general election. But, but in a sense, since uh, you mentioned about Rahul Gandhi visiting temples and not me. Create uh, <laughs> strike. The, 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 fact is, the fact is both Jawaharlal Nehru and even Mahatma Gandhi, who was a practicing, believing Hindu, for them Hinduism was about values. And the fear that one has is that today Hinduism is about rituals. I need to go to the temple in a way to actually almost wear my Hinduism on, a, uh, on my sleeve because that is what electoral vote bank politics demands. And I'm just wondering whether the reason perhaps for the failure, if I may say so, of, of your party is that you never abide and embrace the values consistently over a period of time. Have we lost the values? And is your book in a sense an attempt to remind people that values above all are what are at the core of Hinduism, not so much the rituals of being a Hindu. Yeah, for me that's very much the case. In fact, you know, the classic sort of fourfold division of uh, the ways in which one can, one, can, one can reach out, as it were, to the absolute. There is uh, Jnana Yoga, basically involves knowledge, reading, some, some uh, experiential knowledge, but it's about knowledge. There is Bhakti Yoga, which is worship, ritual, and so on. There is... Um, very much karma yoga, action, uh, mm -hmm. service. And that there is raja yoga, which, which is the breath, the meditative uh, internal capacities. And for myself, I would say that um, uh, I probably have tried to proceed in that order, in that my appreciation of faith has much more to do with modest stabs at jnana yoga uh, and, and, and at karma yoga, rather than at bhakti yoga, which for me is much less important. Now for others, and I would argue with many, Many Hindus I know, including in my own family, bhakti takes precedence. Going to the temple is their principal affirmation, or praying in a prayer room at home. Uh, so to my mind, these are all valid ways. I, I don't particularly argue that one way is right or wrong or better than another. It's simply the way that's good for you, that's right for you, as your way of reaching out to, to what you want to understand. Well, you know that is. Yes, I, what I'd like to say is, the, the dichotomy that you are trying to bring about between what you call ritual and values is a false one. 
Going to temple <coughs> is a very important act for millions and millions of Hindus. We don't have to be apologetic about going to temple. Mm -hmm. I've not only gone to temples, I've built temples all the way from Kashmir down to uh, uh, Pondicherry. Uh, my latest temple I built was a Nataraja temple in Pondicherry. So going to a temple is something very important and millions of people do that. Mm -hmm. They go to the, uh, the, uh, the great uh, Yajyas when these people get together. Uh, millions and millions of people get together uh, every four years. So you cannot trash that and call that, dismiss all that as ritual and simply talk of values as some kind of disembodied uh, ideas. In Hinduism, you've got to, for example, like Muslims going to the mosque is very important for them. On Fridays, they do their namaz. It's important. So you can't dismiss these or going to church. I'm not saying there are many people who don't have to go to the temple. There are many Hindus who don't have to go to the temple. They're not necessary. Because the, let me give you a definition of, of the divine. People often ask me, what is your definition of God? This is two lines from Shankarajaya. Tejo mayam savuna nirguna madhvitiyam ananda kandam aparajitam aparmeyam nagatmakam satala nishkalam aparupam aras. Tejo mayam savuna nirguna. Effulgent, with and without attitude. <coughs> so God with form is very important and God without form. I cannot worship a God without form, frankly. It doesn't excite me. I need a form. I have Shiva worship. I like to see the Nataraj. I love the Nataraj. But it doesn't mean that that is the only way you can approach them. Saguna Nirguna Advitiyo, unique. Ananda Kandam, the abode of bliss. Aparajatam, the, the in unconquerable. Aprameyam, the unimaginable. That is divine for us. So why do you say ritual? Ritual. And I'm not talking about the abhorrent practices that are in Hindu. And Shashi is very clearly outlined. Yeah, one of, for example, this untouchability is absolute, complete, utter nonsense. I mean, it goes against the basic Vedantic principle of, of uh, Ishwara Sarvabhuta Anam Hitesha Kishtimu. The Lord resides in the heart of all beings. If the Lord resides in the heart of all beings, how can you discriminate upon by, uh, on anything? I agree with you. But don't, don't just dismiss all worship as ritual. In fact, on this question of untouchability, I do have, I do address this in the book. Uh, and one of the stories I, I like to tell is, um, is of Adi Shankara on his long march up to the, up to the north. Uh, encounters a Chandala, uh, a Dalit, in, in, in Varanasi. And his followers say to the Chandala, get out of the sage's way. And the Chandala doesn't budge. And he says directly to the sage, he says, is not the Atman within you the same as the Atman within me? And Adi Shankara prostrates himself at the feet of the Dalit and says, you are my guru. You have understood what I've been trying to teach far better. It turns out that was believed to be Shiva himself. And he had four dogs with him, which were the four Vedas. So look, if the Shiva can appear as a Chandala, for God's sake, kiss Mose Ham It is a disgrace and it's an insult to him. So what would you tell the Ambedkarites? Who would today turn around and say that the Hinduism, and even in Shashi's book, the Hinduism is at the core of Brahmanical Hinduism. That is antithetical to notions of true social justice. So have that it, it's all very well in the book and in the text to say what you're saying, but in reality, it is a hierarchical religion that is antithetical to notions of social justice. It so happens neither Shashi nor I are Brahman. Right. I don't know whether you are or not. I am. <laughs> I have <laughs> wrote a text in the Torah about being a God Saraswati. Yeah, I, 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 now, I am now very cautious before I say that in public. But I am among the low caste fish eating Brahmins, so forget about that. Uh, but, but having said that, Ambedkarites will turn around and say that Hinduism essentially remains in practice hierarchical, was for centuries hierarchical, and is therefore antithetical to notions of true, genuine social justice. But I agree with you that our great philosophical concepts uh, cohabitate with a very, very unfair and cruel social system. There's no doubt about it. Any more than, for example, the great, greatest philosophy of the West, the Greeks, was based on slavery. But that doesn't mean that the teachings of Plato are to be rejected just because it was based on slavery. And it doesn't mean that the great truths of the Upanishads should be rejected because of a social system, which is obviously very unfair. And every social reformer, worth his name or her name, has attacked it. The first thing they've done is to attack the hierarchical system. 
whether it is uh, Dr. Ambedkar came much later, of course, whether it is early, earlier on with Radha Ram Mohan Roy and Tibindana Thakur and the Prasna Samaj and the Arya Samaj and, and Vivekananda himself. He said, your, if your religion is a kitchen religion, if by eating with somebody your religion collapses, then it needs to be, it needs to collapse. It's not worth it. <laughs> this is the sort of thing, any, all the great thinkers of Hinduism fulminated against it. And I think the Vedras are right. We have a very unhappy history of social discrimination. There's no doubt about it. But we've got to get over that now. And we've got to, got to somehow get that behind us. And we can't entirely blame the faith for it. Because as Dr. Karan Singh says, the fact is that society is one thing, faith is another. I mean, the fact that Hinduism privileges acceptance and tolerance doesn't mean that every Hindu behaves tolerantly. Individuals in their own sort of secular life, as it were, uh, can behave inappropriately. And as far as caste is concerned, I have found and quoted in my book a number of instances that actually substantiate the counter argument that caste is not important. There's a wonderful story about uh, this childhood friend of Lord Krishna's who gets a boon from him that, uh, you know, whenever he's thirsty, Lord Krishna will ensure he gets water, will, 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 will give him water. And this friend is sort of wandering through the forest loses his way, becomes incredibly thirsty, so finally he invokes this boon, and Lord Krishna doesn't appear. So he goes on, sort of struggling on, more and more thirsty and desperate, again Lord Krishna doesn't appear, and then he comes across this hunter, you know, clad in animal, rag, animal uh, skin and, and dirty rags, who offers him liquid from a, a, a dirty animal skin pouch. And this Chap says, you know, very haughtily, I'm a Brahmin, I'm not going to touch all this. Well, the man says, you're thirsty. Have some of this. It will quench your thirst. And the fellow says, no, 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 go. And he's silently cursing Krishna for having let him down. And the hunter duly disappears. And in a few minutes, of course, Lord Krishna appears and says, I had sent you Lord Indra himself. And what he was offering you was not just water. It was Amrit, the nectar of immortality. But because you paid attention to his caste and to the externalities of his social status, you forfeited not only the chance to slake your thirst, but the chance of immortality. Now, this is a, you know, as valid a story to tell as, say, you can cite Manu as, as writing blood-curdlingly nasty things about the lower caste. You take your pick. The great thing about Hinduism is all these are available to you. So for every, every sort of snooty, upper caste guy, I won't point fingers, <laughs> who uh, claims to find scriptural justification for his prejudices, we can point you, and Dr. Karan Singh far more than me, can point you to scriptural justification that says this is not an acceptable practice. And that's the good thing about Hinduism. Don't blame the religion, blame the social practice that you have chosen to follow. But in a strange way, what you say, and you describe it in your earlier conversation as an open source religion in a sense, for the 21st century could be both its strength and weakness. For example, in your book, at various stages, you quote Vivekananda to emphasize the point about the need for tolerance, acceptance, uh, for, for making religion more inclusive. Now, Narendra Modi and the BJP also see Vivekananda as a Hindutva icon, as a nationalist icon. So but the only difference is I've actually read him. <laughs> He might have written some bad poetry on it, but we will leave that for another day and another time. But, but, I, but, but that isn't that precisely it. That today, a BJP leader can also turn around and say, look, I am a bhakt of Vivekananda. I am a follower of Vivekananda. Vivekananda's really, uh, definition of Hinduism is my definition of Hinduism. Shashi Tharoor can stand up and write a book and say, Vivekananda, I am appropriating Vivekananda, his vision and his Description of religiosity is what I believe in. And that perhaps is also weakness in a way, rather than a strength. No, because on, on a statement, again, I defer to Dr. Karan Singh on this, but frankly, I think that the way in which the BJP projects Vivekananda is completely uh, ill-founded, in fact, is, is not based on a close or even a casual reading of everything Vivekananda said. He spoke for the most part in English, as many of you know. And so I've actually read the original, as it were, and I can, I can tell you. Uh, what he believes and what he stands for. Uh, and and uh, when these people, for example, will highlight a sentence like, you know, arise, awake, and sort of stand up and say things like, be proud of being a Hindu, what was it he wanted us to take pride in? He wanted us to take pride in precisely this. 
the acceptance of other faiths that I talked about in my remarks. He wanted us to take pride in the fact, as he said, the Hindu may throw himself on the pyre, but he will not light the flames of inquisition. Exactly the opposite of what's going on today, where people in the name of Hinduism, uh, blasphemously citing Vivekananda, are indeed trying to light the fires of inquisition against other people. So anyone who has read Vivekananda cannot possibly put him on the side of the bigots, the, the chauvinists, and the people who are, uh, who are frankly giving Hinduism a bad name these days. Why is, it then that, why is it then that such conversation, Dr. Singh, in today's political discourse and indeed in, in common discourse gets such saliency? Why is it that such forces who speak about a Hinduism that perhaps divides and doesn't unite, that speaks of a Hinduism that, that in a sense pits them versus us, that actually in the name of uh, nationalism preaches a certain kind of majoritarianism. Why is it that those voices you believe are getting so much of saliency? Why, why, why has that happened? Well, there are multiple reasons for that, but uh, one point, I'd like to make one point which people generally forget. All Indians are not Hindus and all Hindus are not Indians. There are millions of Hindus living around the world who are devout Hindus, they're not Indians. So to link Hinduism necessarily with nationalism, I think is, is incorrect. Because that means that we are disenfranchising millions of Hindus who live abroad, that you, you are not Hindus because you are not Indian. So the confusion between being Indian and being Hindu, Hinduism is a world religion, as is Islam, as is Christianity. It's now becoming widespread uh, around the world, mainly because of the Indians who went from here in the first uh, phase of indentured labor and now with the affluent Hindus around the world, beautiful temples around the world. That's one point. Secondly, why is this? Because obviously the party that is in power today came into power largely on, if one might call, a sort of the, the Hindu, uh, Hindu um, um, what should I call, the Hindu approach, the Hindu um, viewpoint, which is, which is to my mind, not really the Vedantic viewpoint. As uh, Shashi says, Hinduism is a vast ocean. You can choose from that a number of uh, statements that uh, go against the Vedanta. But the fundamental principles, I submit, are to be found in the Upanishads. And they represent the true fundamentals of Hinduism. So you think Hinduism is irreconcilable with this notion of nationalism? Not irreconcilable, no, no. Not irreconcilable. It cannot be reduced only to nationalism. It's not irreconcilable, of course. You know, and, and there were many reasons, I don't want to go into that, why, why, why the, you wrote that book on 2014, the excellent book that says it all, I don't have to repeat that. But uh, it is not at all irreconcilable, but to reduce uh, Hinduism only to nationalism, I think, is to be unfair. But is it a powerful, is, is it a powerful message in a sense? When I, when I deliberately or otherwise link a great religion to the notion of nationalism, am I doing disservice? To, these, to the great traditions of the religion. You see, most, most uh, national, for example, the national upsurges uh, in all over the world, a lot of them had a religious underpinning, whether they were Islam, whether they were Islam. And it is true that Hinduism does represent 82% of India's population. It is true that, uh, uh, you know, uh, a sort of a situation was sort of developing where uh, there was a feeling that Hinduism uh, it's not it's unfashionable to talk about it. Why talk about religion at all? That's not the Fabian dismissal of, of religion. Javadar to a large extent followed that, you know. This is the thing. I think a restatement of Hinduism is a good thing, provided the restatement involves the rearticulation of the fundamental values, as Shashi has done so brilliantly in the first part. And, and, and one of those, one of the fascinating parts of, of, of religion, of, of Hinduism, and you reflected in your book, a Kerala, uh, and then coming to terms with Hinduism of, of, of in a sense, of the North, uh, and, and the sheer diversity and pluralism of traditions that exist within. Do you believe that needs to be appreciated much more than we have chosen to do this attempt, in a sense, to homogenize a religion which at the very core is defined by plural traditions? Yes, and I would even argue that there is a certain historical difference 
in the experience, for example, that North India had uh, with, in regard to the Muslim invasions. And Kerala Islam came peacefully. The message of the Prophet was carried by the same sorts of people who for the preceding centuries had been trading from the Arab world with Kerala. And they brought the message, and in fact, the message was heard, amongst others, by a Kerala king who traveled off to the, uh, to the Arab Peninsula to meet the Prophet in his own lifetime. That's one of the reasons, by the, by the way, that is the reason that uh, right now, alongside the coast uh, of Oman, near Muscat, you find Kerala coconut trees growing. Because this Kerala king took some coconuts with him. He didn't make it back. The Pochia passed away on the peninsula. But the coconuts he took were planted. And we have now Kerala coconut trees growing in the Arab Peninsula, to which they're not native. Uh, but this is also part of the... So, so the, the sort of complex that exists in the north doesn't exist so much in the south. But in the north, there's another problem, which is that Hindutva, in many ways, is born of a sort of inferiority complex. It is people who seem to see their faith as one that has been conquered, humiliated, subjugated, trampled upon, that they've been subject, as they see, to 1,200 years of quote-unquote foreign rule and so on. It's they who are <laughs> turning around and saying that uh, it's now time for us to, to assert ourselves. Whereas the Hinduism that <laughs> Dr. Karan Singh expresses, that I express, is a much more self-confident faith. It's comfortable in its own skin, as it were, and does not feel the need. Now, he's right, and he did say this to me, that partition is something that perhaps I should have given more space to in the book, because that partly explains a lot of the, uh, the impetus that was given to the RSS and, and, and others thereafter. But that still is a political social uh, event. It has very little to do with the, the values of the faith, which were inclusive. After all, the Bhakti movement is very strong in the North. And if you look at Kabir, Look at Nanak, look at Meera. You're not, and there's a lovely translation of Meera by Dr. Karan Singh that I've, I've put into the book. Uh, you've, you've got, you've got uh, a very sort of all-embracing sort of attitude to faith, which I think is very difficult to reconcile with the petty bigotry that's being propagated today in the name of Hindus. Basically, from Kabir to Aditya Nath, we've gone a long way. <laughs> we've come a long way in the wrong direction, possibly. And I know now why you've chosen the safety in a sense of Tiruvananthapuram. <laughs> Uh, as, uh, as your electoral constituency. But the fact is, uh, you say in your book, and then I'll get Dr. Singh on this, that despite attracting the program of the Hindutva Brigade, I do believe that propagating dharma and instilling it at all levels, and instilling at all levels the need to live according to one's dharma can be the key to bridging the gap between the religious and the secular in India. I asked you this earlier, and I know it's a complicated question that cannot be reduced to a sound bite. Define your notion of dharma for me, because that is central in a sense to, to, to what really Hindu philosophy is about. <coughs> Define dharma as you see it today. You know, actually the best definition I got was from a Muslim friend. But before I get there, I should explain that uh, everyone, I'm sure Dr. Karan Singh will not disagree, will tell you that it's impossible to render a one word or one phrase translation of dharma. It can mean so many different things. I've got a little passage in the book in which I describe some of the very many meanings and translations that have been given by various authorities to a dharma. Is it law? Is it faith? Is it righteousness? Is it right conduct? A Muslim friend of mine, sadly who passed away some years ago, uh, said it's very simply that by which you should live. And to me, it, I thought it was an absolutely superb way of looking at it. That by which you should live. What is your sense of your duty to yourself and to others, to, you, to the world in which you live, the society in which you live? Um, all that is your dharma. The right conduct, the right action. Live up to your own moral code, if you like. But all of these are inadequate terms. Uh, you, you really need about 17 different words to encapsulate all that comes into dharma. The, the, the reason I'm asking this, I remember a car sevak once telling me in Ayodhya while I was covering the agitation 25 years ago, saying, Hamara dharma hai ki ek Ram Mandir waha banana hai. And I just wondered whether the notion of dharma, his notion of duty, his moral code, if you want to call it right, was to build a Ram temple in Ayodhya, Dr. Singh. So I, I just wonder whether the notion of dharma, also typical of Hinduism, is so genuine. That it can be used differently by different people. That's it. The policeman should have had his dharma and stopped this fellow. That's, that's right. <laughs> that is right. Yeah. Well, let, let me say, the word dharma comes from the root three, which means that which supports. Dharma is the, is the 
the philosophical and ideological foundation of one's life. And it varies. There is no one clear cut, narrow thought. You are living. He went to the third man and said, what are you doing? He said, sir, I am building a great temple. So they were doing the same thing. But the way in which they were doing it, the approach, their, their, their intellectual and philosophical and spiritual background makes a lot of difference. So some people can look upon dharma in a very, uh, very uh, narrow manner. Some people may believe that. I mean, I don't want to get into the controversy of the Ram, Ram temple, but uh, which Hindu would not want a Ram temple to be built in your temple? But say, Ayodhya was the birthplace of Sri Ram. But that doesn't mean that you destroy the existing structure where there were already uh, statues there. I went there, I did an aarti. And then you build it. You, we could have, you know, it could have been done in a different way. So if somebody wants a Ram temple there, they are, my family deity is Sri Ram. The Jammu temple, you've seen it, the great Raghunath temple, although I'm a Ishtadev, yours is Ganesha, mine is Shiva. But, and therefore we would love to see a Ram temple in Ayodhya, provided it is not done in a way that outrages the sentiments of other people, which unfortunately was what happened. So in a sense, there's a moral underpinning to this notion of uh, dharma. Because, you know, for me, the greatest Hindu of the 20th century was Mahatma Gandhi. You know, practicing, believing Hindu, who look at his, his views on the, on the entire debate on cow slaughter just before the Constituent Assembly debates. Believes that cow slaughter should be banned and yet respects the idea that there will be those who today eat beef. And therefore, eventually, as a compromise, let's say, cow slaughter doesn't come within the fundamental rights, but goes within the directive principles. And there seems to be a moral basis to what Gandhi says in that context, that I will not impose my views on someone else. I'm just wondering how much of that spirit requires a huge moral force that that great man had. And today's netas, dare I say, or today's public figures lack that moral force. Which is why you become a Gaurakshak. You know, Mahatma Gandhi was a Gaurakshak but didn't need to tell the world that he was a Gaurakshak. And in fact, and he didn't need to hit anybody on the head. Certainly didn't. But that apart, I'm just wondering whether this therefore the notion of dharma, the Gandhian vision of dharma, was a vision which was non-violent, uh, non tolerant, but, uh, you know, uh, accommodating, accepting, respectful. Are those values, I come back to those values the key in a sense? To, to why, as you say, you are a Hindu? Yes, they are. Though I think, I think uh, Dr. Kansing already answered that in the sense that the values are important, but so too are the whole set of other things that go with the faith, including its practice, including its imagery, its iconography, its stories. I mean, Hinduism actually imparted a, a lot of its lessons through stories. I mean, the Puranas, the Hitopadesha, the, uh, the, the uh, epics themselves, the Itihasas, uh, what extraordinary uh, uh, ways of communicating certain moral precepts as well as certain religious lessons through stories. Uh, I think all of that is part of Hinduism as well. Yes, the values, the philosophy, I'm very attracted by these ideas. I, I describe, for example, how, um, how, how Hinduism deals with life and death. How Hinduism deals with this great conundrum that so many other religions and might have stumbled before, which is, if God is there, why are you suffering? Why does he allow, he or however you personify God, allow suffering for those who are devout and are being good, good human beings? And, and, you know... Which could be troubling. Yeah. Which is troubling. I mean, the Ambedkar, the Ambedkarites would challenge that, uh, the, uh, that sort of saying, I, I, vision not, of Hinduism. I, 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 I too, as I mentioned in the book, I'm troubled by the answer, but at least it is an answer that's intellectually consistent. That you are essentially uh, not a foreign object to God, God suffers with you, but you are paying essentially for wrongs of a previous life. But I think the one point I would like to add also, Hinduism is the only religion that has gender parity. It's very important. Most of the religions that you know look upon God as a male, he. We do not. The goddess is as important as a god. We worship the goddess first. It's Radha Krishna. It's Sita Ram. It's Parvati Sankar. You know, so however much we may, may have mistreated our women, however misogynist our, uh, our background may have been, the fact is that we do not accept the fact of a, an, an only exclusively male divinity. It doesn't work that way. 
But isn't that partly the problem that there is a huge gap and divergence, therefore, between Hinduism and its classic or between precept and practice? No, no, but I mean, mean, for years, women have never been given their due in society. But I think at least the philosophical foundations are there. How do you worship? Why do you worship? You cannot worship uh, Krishna without worshipping Radha. You cannot. And one of the things I find, I might remark, all the the new, the Sri Rama that uh, we have uh, uh, talked about. Where is Sita? Have we divorced Sita again? <laughs> if it's going to be a temple, it's going to be a temple of Sita Ram, not only of Ram. If I'm a Raghu Vamsha, I'm a descendant of Ram, I'm also a descendant of Sita. I'm as proud of that. So this is an important point which is often missed, number one. Number two, I come from a Muslim majority state. From childhood, we've been worshipping at Hindu shrines, obviously, but also at Muslim shrines. At, at Chirare Sharif, or at Magdoom Sahab, or at Hazrat Bal. You see, we've never found. But that is because Islam came to India in two incarnations. The ones who came as predators, as oppressors, as iconoclasts, they are not remembered with any sense of... Uh, any positive sense. But the ones who came, the Sufis who came, Shah Hamdan came from Iran with 700 followers to Kashmir. And the, the biggest Muslim uh, shrine outside of Makkah and Medina itself is the Dargah Sharif of, of, of Hazar Mehnuddin Chishti in Ajmer. So Islam, when we talk about Islam, Islam is not ISIS only. Islam is also Jalaluddin Rumi. And it would be tragic if we reduce Islam to ISIS. Or if you reduce Hinduism, to, to what you are saying, to, to, to the, to the. I think it's very well said. So in a sense, there are those who are seeking to Semitize Hinduism and almost make it a mimic or a copy of a form of radical orthodox Islam with its emphasis on fatwas and blasphemy laws. Which then brings me back to the question where, which in a way is perhaps one of the reasons why Shashi wrote the book or the third part of his book, which is the call to action. How do you actually reclaim uh, this sort of pure, pluralistic, lived experience religion rather than the attempt being made to mimic some form of orthodoxy. How do you actually reclaim it? How Do you need a Gandhi-like figure with that moral force to reclaim it? Who, who, who can reclaim a religion in the polarizing times in which we live? No one man can do it. It has to be a collective endeavor. It has to be people like you and me, like Shashi, people in this audience. You've got to realize, without dismissing Hinduism, my objection to many people is that they dismiss Hinduism. You know, it's ritual, it's this thing, it's, it's not. It, it is, as um, Shashi rightly said, it's a whole ocean. You can take from it what you want. We have to be selective. We have to be selective and we have to re-articulate what I call the Neo-Vedanta, which is the Vivekananda Radha Krishna tradition. And that, I think, is what Shashi and I, in our own way, are trying to do. So is, is it reclaiming the philosophical traditions you believe? Because Shashi, you write in the book uh, about how you feel rooted in Hinduism, that hi your Hinduism, that Hinduism is your natural resting place because it is fundamentally a religion that espouses a liberal humanism. Do you believe that has to be, in a sense, reclaimed by the average Indian? That liberal, humanistic spirit that, in a sense, is is really the hallmark of this wonderful society that we are part of. That's precisely my point. I think that's exactly what Dr. Karan Singh was saying as well. Uh, our writings about Hinduism in our own ways have actually been an attempt uh, to reclaim that space. Um, I certainly hope that this book will speak. I've already been gratified to meet people who have come and said to me that this book has expressed for them what they had not quite known how to put words to, but which was indeed their own experience of Hinduism. And that is precisely the impact that I hope the book will have, that more and more Hindus will say, this is, you know, when, when we are challenged by the Hindutva Brigade, Garv Se Kaho Ke Hindu Hai, I think they're going to be, I hope, able to say after reading this book, yes, Garv Se Mein Kehta Hoon, Ki Main Hindu Hoon, but not the kind of Hindu that Savarkar and Golvalkar and even the other Padhya is talking about, but the kind of Hindu that Dr. Karan Singh and I hope David, we need a Hindi translation very quickly. <laughs> yes, it's being, it's being worked on right now. So in a sense, you are widening your political constituency. <laughs> <laughs> You're hoping that there are people out there who will challenge, uh, in, in a sense, those who... He's, who he's fulfilling his political dharma. <laughs> he's fulfilling his political dharma. 
I'm just wondering whether there are people in the audience who have a couple of questions. Uh, so then we'll try and get, we'll start with this young man here. I don't know if there's a mic. There is a mic. Just take the mic and if you want to just, uh, your name and then just, yeah. and keep the question short. Yes, so my name is Arunesh Chandra and uh, I have a question for Dr. Thirula. I'm a big fan of his and, uh, but this book coming from a champion of, uh, you know, champion of liberals as you are, uh, is it not a, a step backward? Because I heard you say that uh, you had a little fling with atheism back in the college days. So, in all over the uh, advanced developed world, the way forward is atheism, you know, the fastest growing uh, belief system. And this book is, uh, you know, you're going, taking us back, promoting why I'm a Hindu, then it again puts us all back in that competition, you know, which is better. Which okay, is right. Well, I mean, fastest growing or not, uh, you should appreciate that the vast majority of the world in multiple surveys vast majority, meaning close to 90% in most countries, is in fact um, believing in one faith or another. So, uh, as far as I'm aware, I don't have the latest figures, but it may be growing from, I don't know, 7% to 8% or something, but it's not uh, uh, in any way uh, a major development. And in fact, what we're seeing politically in many countries across the world is actually more celebration of religion, of rootedness, of uh, quote-unquote cultural authenticity, whether it's Mr. Erdogan being a better Muslim, Mr. Trump being a better Christian, or Mr. Modi being a better Hindu, these are all global phenomena that you can witness and analyze politically. So I, I, I would contest the suggestion that the world is actually heading in the direction that you imply. In fact, I think there's plenty of evidence that the world is actually heading in the opposite direction, becoming more conscious of religion then in the much more liberal and secular 60s and 70s, which, which perhaps were the sort of more godless era of, of uh, promiscuous lifestyles and, 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 and free thinking thought. Uh, the, other, the other point that I would like to make is that um, speaking about Hinduism in the terms in which I do is not only not incompatible with other faiths, it is also not incompatible with atheism. I actually point out that, in fact, one of the schools of Hindu philosophy, the Charvaka school, explicitly disavowed, maybe agnostic is the word rather than atheist, but they explicitly disavowed the probability of the, of the existence of God. And they were scathing and contemptuous in many ways of those who believed that there was a God and that ritual would propitiate a God and so on. And they were nakedly materialist. And they're accepted as one of the, the, uh, the, the schools of, of philosophy in our faith. So that range of belief is always permissible. And in any case, the principle of Hinduism is choose to believe what you choose to believe. After all, in Nirugana Brahma, the idea of a God without qualities, without uh, shape, form, substance, etc., uh, was the initial idea. The idea of the Saguna Brahman comes later when people realize that this is one of the things that's costing them popular following in Hinduism. <laughs> and then they say, all right, why don't you start worshiping? an image of God and the notion of Ishwara, of, of Bhagwan comes into being where people start personifying or anthropomorphizing images of God. So you can pick, if you, if you want, you can say that I am quote unquote culturally a Hindu, but religiously an agnostic. You would still be acceptable. There's no problem with that. Yes, sir. I'm Rachel Dwyer and I've, I've read why I'm not a Hindu. I'm looking forward to reading why I am a Hindu. But a book that I'd be very interested in is a book about why I became a Hindu. One of the things that's fascinating for, about Hinduism is how one can become a Hindu. What excludes one from being a Hindu? You said you were born one. How is somebody who's not born one able to become one? Well, yes, where well, did you go? First, first of all, there are, there are certain sects. I agree there used to be a lot of rigidity about becoming a Hindu. But uh, with the Renaissance uh, in the 19th century, there are certain sects that, for example, the Arya Samaj. The Arya Samaj, you can become a Hindu quite easily. There's no, there's no problem about it. And uh, lakhs of people in North India, in fact, became Hindus because of the Arya Samaj. Also, let me tell you, there's a Shaiva Siddhanta church in Hawaii, a magnificent uh, uh, Shiva temple in Hawaii. And they have he's come out with a book, How to Become a Hindu. It's quite possible. It's not impossible to become a Hindu. So the idea that 
you know, you can never become a Hindu if you're not born. It's not true. It so happened, my, my uh, Vaishnava guru were Englishmen, and my American, my Shaiva guru was an American, and both were non-Hindu born. There are some temples, in fact, where, particularly, I'm sorry to say, in South India, where they don't admit non-Hindus. So someone who looks like you would find it difficult to get in unless you produce a certificate from the Arya Samaj to say you married a Hindu. Big about? I got into Madurai. You got into There you are. So you see, everything is everything is possible. <coughs> open source. <laughs> yes. Uh, so uh, Yadunandan Sharma. Yeah. Uh, your book looks more of a political jibe at RSS uh, and the likes. So are Hindus in Congress different from the Hindus in BJP? That's my first question. <laughs> types of Hindus are there, uh, like, so for a youngster like me, it's confusing now. <laughs> also, uh, there's another question, uh, I would... Uh, uh, let's leave it at the one. Let's leave it at the one. The second one and that's all. I mean, no, no, uh, let's leave it at the one. Okay. Because there are, there are numerous others who will then also want to ask. The second question would be more appropriate actually. Though, okay, know. go ahead. Uh, has Hinduism lost its luster over a, a certain period wherein it has become a more convenient or uh, flexible dharma or religion? Is this convenience not a grave concern for our religion with a Chalta high attitude which may lead to deterioration of the religion and uh, gradual extinction? Well, the first is, uh, what's the difference between a Hindu in the, in the BJP RSS, in the Sankh Paribar and a Hindu who is in the Congress? I think it depends on the individual. I'm sure there are reasonable Hindus in every party and there are uh, unreasonable ones in every party. But the fact is that those who subscribe to the tenets of Hindutva uh, and who genuinely believe in the ideas of Savarkar, Gorvalkar, Upadhyay, Hegdevar, there's a, a certain, shall we say, set of authorities on that. If they genuinely believe it, I think there are many, many people in the BJP who haven't read a word of any of these characters either, not just in their column, they haven't read their own gurus, but if they genuinely believe that, of course, their view is incompatible with the, the pluralist accommodation. I think I must but, but, but be honest, so, sorry to interrupt, be honest, Dr. Singh. Isn't it true? Because, uh, you know, Doctor, uh, you will remember a contemporary of yours, Vithal Rao Gargit, senior Congress leader. He once wrote a small booklet about secularism. And he told me an interesting story, which is there in his book, that he once broke a coconut at a political rally. And he got a call from Delhi saying, what is this? You're breaking a coconut. You're having some rituals. We are a secular party. And I just wonder whether someone like you, an open, practicing, believing Hindu, for a long time in the Congress party, was in a sense, looked at with a measure of skepticism and that was the problem of the Congress. And that is where the BJP today is appropriate in the Arya Samaj also. They will say, this is a cultural renaissance. We are recapturing the cultural aspects of Hinduism, which the Congress for a long time was either diffident about embracing or apologetic yes, about all there, there's some truth in that, there's no doubt about it. But people who would object to breaking a coconut would be sort of secular fundamentalists. <laughs> and I don't think that's a particularly good idea. But I want to say one thing to the young man there. The only Hindus who will have a real problem are those who belong to the communist parties. Because the communist parties specifically lay down that you cannot follow religion. Khrushchev gave a party for me and my wife in the Kremlin when we went there in 1961. I asked him, I said, Mr. General Secretary, can you in your country be a member of the CPSU, Communist Party of Soviet Union? and a believer. He said, no, we cannot. For to be a member of, we respect religions, but to be a member of the CPSU, you have to be an atheist. I asked the same question to Hu Jintao, whom I met three years ago, four years in China, sitting next to him. He gave me the same reply. He said, no. And here also, the Communist Party, the Unko Poochwa, the Communist Hindu, hai, unki kya rasha no, but how, did you, how do you respond to a Narayan Murthy, for example? Sorry to be a television anchor. But just, uh, how would you therefore respond to a Narayan Murthy, the former Infosys, the Infosys founder, once told me, public figures in India, in a multi-faith, plural society like India, must stay away from religion in their public life. That it is one thing to break a coconut at home, but you don't do it. When the Prime Minister, for example, now does the Ganga Aarti, and then it's televised live, but will not attend an iftar party that the President of India throws. What is the message that's going out? The answer is to do both. <laughs> attend the iftar party and also do the Ganga Aarti. <laughs> and you know, we still we launch ships in India by smashing a coconut on the hull. Exactly the same way that uh, that the Westerners will smash a bottle of champagne on the hull. 
So the cultural aspects of Hinduism can cheerfully be embraced. And if you happen to not believe in coconut smashing, and you, let's say your faith is, doesn't involve coconut smashing, you can sort of see it the way in which a teetotaler in the West would see the bottle of champagne. So am I, am I to understand, uh, Shashi, that if you were to be Prime Minister of India, you would do a Ganga Aarti and ask it to be put out on live television? Listen, I'm not going to be Prime Minister of India, so don't get me about that wicked part. That was a difficult question. But the fact is that uh, the fact is that I would happily smash that coconut the and French drink the champagne. The French president was also there when the article was televised. Remember that? Yes, right. Yes, the gentleman. Yes, at the bar. But Sanjim. just on the communist thing, I couldn't help yes. the digression. I saw Salim. Uh, two Carolite. Uh, I mean, I have I have a good Ooh. friend in the in the Roma audience. Salim is here. He's yes. sitting right there, but I won't ask him. He's a devout. He's a devout worshipper of uh, Durga as well as a communist. <laughs> and he was also Muhammad Salim. So <laughs> that's right. Uh, but no, I just want to say that that. Uh, uh, two things. One is that, you know, uh, these Devasman boards that run the temples, uh, the only requirement is that you have to be a believing Hindu to serve on the Devasman board. So whenever the communists come to power in Kerala, they appoint a whole lot of... And somebody went to court and said, Communist Party says they can't have a religious faith. How can they be on the Devasman board as good Hindus? And actually, these chaps took an oath before the court that they were good Hindus. Yesterday, uh, two days ago, and yesterday, in fact, I was at a function in, in, in Tiruvannathapuram, and sitting right next to me was the local communist councillor, who had a very prominent, uh, no, no, she, she was a woman. She had various sort of uh, 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 chandanam and kumkumam and so on on her, on her forehead. So I, in a mischievous moment during the, the <laughs> more boring speeches that were going on, I said to her, I see you've just been to a mother. And she said, yes. And I said, uh, does your party approve? And she looked at me and said, this is my personal belief. <laughs> so we can reconcile anything in our country. Yes, uh, Satyam Singh, sir. Uh, sir, I want to ask you that the Hindus are demanding only three temples in India. So, do Muslims, who are all the brothers, do they not want to show these three mandirs to their big heart? Because Swami has said that if we take them from somewhere, we will take them from somewhere, we will take them from somewhere, we will take them from somewhere. Masjid can be sitted, but what do you want to make a mandir or give a problem? That's a political question that you may want to answer. You don't want to answer. Shashi, you want to give a brief answer to, to, to the larger political debate. The brief and answer is the one Dr. Karanjim already gave in the context of Ayodhya. We have holy places, but we don't build them by destroying other people's places. That's essentially the issue. So where something stands already, knocking it down is very difficult to accept, both in terms of the faith and also in terms of the interests of public law and order in a secular democracy. <laughs> it, yes, the bell. We just take a couple. We just have time for a couple of more. Yes, the person. We we'll take one this side. Uh, Doctor Thiru, like uh, almost everyone of your age, that is early twenties. I am also an ardent admirer of yours. I want to ask. Uh, you said uh, in, in your speech that uh, for the caste system, we should not blame the religion but the social practice. But I want to ask you that how do you propose to reclaim Hinduism from its major ill, that is the caste system, which made Dr. Ambedkar shun it. And I personally believe that Dr. Ambedkar was very right in saying that if we want to end the caste system, we need to end Hinduism, which is Brahminism. So what do you propose for that? And given the irregular politics of a country, it seems that caste will never become irregular. No, first of all, I addressed this briefly in the book, perhaps too briefly, uh, from the taste of some of my friends. Uh, one of the challenges, I was brought up by parents uh, who really were from that nationalist generation. My father dropped his caste surname during the, the nationalist, during his college days before independence, because Gandhiji wanted people to drop their caste surnames. Uh, whenever friends from school would come home to play, come home for birthday parties, whatever, never once did my parents make any comment about their religion or their caste. It was many years uh, later that I began to be conscious of all these things. Now, that obliviousness to caste was something that that particular generation, I would say Dr. Karan Singh's generation, particularly valued. Uh, Nehru actually wrote that he expected caste to disappear and consciousness of caste to disappear from India. And of course he was wrong because politics actually entrenched consciousness of caste, created a situation in which caste became an instrument for political mobilization. And then people became all the more conscious uh, that what their caste identity was and that's continued now to get to a point where everyone is aware of it. So, one of the things I've quoted in the book is an exchange I had uh, with a, a very young Dalit, presumably Dalit blogger, who, who turned around and said to me about one of my, it was actually sparked by something Radhi had said, 
I, I, I've not gone into much detail about that in this book, but you can get the full story in my earlier book, India Shastra. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, she said that essentially obliviousness to caste is also a luxury of the privileged. She said, no Dalit can be oblivious to caste. So for you to make a virtue, I mean, I, for example, have never once asked the caste of anybody I've hired in my office or my home. I don't know the <laughs> caste of my cook. And if he's a Dalit tomorrow, I wouldn't change the way I eat his food. I, it just isn't the way I think. It's not the way I was brought up to think. I recognize that perhaps she is right. That, you know, had I been a Dalit, mm -hmm. I would have seen around me that the cook would know I'm a Dalit before he decides to work for me or not decide to work for me, etc. And so you've got a situation in which you have to be more caste conscious than ideally you might want to be. But that doesn't mean you can't speak out against it, write against it, and seek to reform it. Gandhiji set such a wonderful example himself in, in his rejection of caste, his cleaning of the toilets himself, and so on. What was the message? You know that, that, uh, that one shouldn't relegate people to certain lot in life, certain professions, certainly merely on the basis of their birth. It's wrong. And we should say it's wrong. Yes. Can I say it's just the two words about caste? Um, two of my granddaughters got married in the last six months. <coughs> One of them married a Sikh <coughs> and the other married a Odia Brahman. So you can see that in many ways the caste system is breaking down. They are not they are a Rajput family. None of them married a Rajput. That's just one point. The second point is when you talk of a casteless society, how can you have a classless society when caste has been now institutionalized and constitutionalized? You have reservations. If you have a caste society, then what happens to the reservation? Get rid of reservation place. You can't have it both ways. You want reservations, then you also want a caste society. So I, I am not, I am not at all saying that we should not have. We should have reservations because of the way, the intolerable way, human way, the uh, outcasts or Dalits or, were treated. But we must realize now that although there may be reservations, in our own personal lives, we don't have to be bound. I've had, I've had Dalit cooks in my house. Half, half my people who work for me are Dalit. So you know, it's beginning to break down. If you have the inner awareness and confidence in your, in your dharma, your religion, you don't have to worry about it. Just two questions. One here uh, yeah. in the front and one there. Yes, you've got a mic already, so take that and yeah. then I'll come back. <coughs> uh, Mr. Tharoor, uh, all the jumlas of NDA are getting... Uh, and the ground reality is not getting... Yeah. So, uh, is eerie feeling of India shining part 2 in 2019, so... Let, let's leave the political questions away from today. I'm going to... Is there a... Is there a lady? Can I get a lady who wants to ask a question? Yes, ma'am, here, and then Rajkumar there. The last two questions. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. The two ladies and Rajkumar. Yes, ma'am, yes. Hi. Two of you, Can one here and one here. Yes. Sure, hi. Uh, my name is Arama. It, it was a wonderful discussion. And I do thoroughly uh, believe in the feeling here. No, Mr. Shashi, you have uh, you just told us about. And I can now proudly say that I am a Hindu. But I also want to add to this fact that uh, why do no still at one point, no, we are saying that no, the people who have devised the constitution were open-minded enough to say that we welcome everybody. But at the same time, probably were not mindful of what it may lead to. Because why is it that the religion is still being picked up, used or misused? by the sometimes you know, politicians, sometimes other people, why is it not said like that, I am a Hindu because I am part of Hindustan and one law applies to everybody, whatever caste I belong to, you know, this is where I belong and the motherland or whatever, right, is the supreme uh, of okay. the Okay, well, let me, uh, that's a comment in a way, but like, I'll get them to address it in some form. Yes, ma'am, you don't have to stand. Well, I have a question, you know, you don't need any more praise than you already have. So let me ask a little bit a critical question. Uh, right in the beginning of this book, I find that um, uh, you have used Madhavacharya uh, Samadarshan Sangha, and you talk about these uh, six schools of philosophy, and uh, then the, you mentioned three, or at least as five. But uh, the question is that when Madhavacharya was making the classification, it's a classification of schools of philosophy. But you are calling everybody a Hindu. I do not know, first of all, how happy the Buddhists and the Jainists going to be at that appellation, let alone the Charvakas. And also, I also want to 
beginning of the book, I have I only got the book today, but it's so interesting I couldn't leave it. Uh, that uh, I uh, can't understand that your emphasis seems to be mostly the flexibility of Hindus, the lack of rigid dogmas, what we don't have like the others have, the organized church, hope, and this and that. But by virtue of that, when you are calling anybody a Hindu, you are actually using nomenclature for designating. Not to, uh, to uh, protect anybody, partly as a result of a reaction to the rise of Islamic fundamentalism. Do not forget that. So that's why Shashi has not said enough about Islam. The uh, surge of Islamic fundamentalism. So you think Hindu revivalism is a reaction? No, it's partially. Please. Or is it to minority appeasement as is defined well, by whatever the way you want to, Whatever you, way you want to put it, the Muslim factor is there in one way or the other. And which doesn't mean, as I said, I come from a Muslim majority state. So the question of... But the fact is that the most Islamic factor is there in the political uh, repercussions and in the political uh, responses. One final question, Dr. Rajkumar. Yes. Congratulations, Shashi, for that uh, fascinating book. Um, thank you to both Dr. Karan Singh and Dati for this really wonderful intellectual discourse. Uh, Shashi, one of the big dilemmas of religion is in some ways to reconcile faith and reason. Now, is, could this be the biggest potential fault line of Hinduism that when people are going to believe in its beliefs and faiths, not necessarily through reason, then to articulate your own set of reasons and reasoning behind the faith will be in itself a contested belief. And in that sense, we will always be struggling to identify that reasonable, rational Hindu. And so, is that the problem why we need to move beyond the <coughs> religious identity? 20 years ago, Amartya Sen gave a lecture entitled Reason Before Identity. And he was conscious of the fact that religious identity in any form of manifestation puts that identity more important than other identities in a world in which we have seen so much of violence through all forms of religious bigotry. Would the identity of identity of being a Hindu itself is a problematic? Should we, in a sense, restore civic nationalism and constitutional nationalism rather than religious nationalism? There will be those who look at this book and say, Shashi Tharoor is reinforcing religious identity in an age when we need to look beyond it. No, I actually explicitly say in the book that, um, that in fact, we should uh, admire religion in its own place about people stretching out their hands to the divine, but not, if possible, not related to identity, that if identity can relate to citizenship, to a territory, to a country, to national allegiance, rather than to a faith, we could prevent the worst clashes of religious fundamentalisms. Uh, on the question of the earlier point you made that reasoning and faith are essentially contradictory, I admit that right up front, even in what I said on the podium, I did say that, you know, this, these are my reasons, but faith requires no reason. And every faith is beyond reasoning. So there, uh, I would say that I'm just offering a set of reasons. His reasons may be different. His reasons may be different. Some may choose to have no reasons at all because faith alone is self-sufficient unto itself. Uh, ultimately, the great thing for me about Hinduism is you can pick and choose not only what kind of Hindu you want to be, but even the answer to the question, why I am a Hindu. On that note, uh, it could go on and on, but I have a day job. Uh, unfortunately, a night job, and I, I have to discuss how one Modi has embarrassed another. Uh, but we shall discuss that on another day. So I, I can, I will have to move away from the philosophical uh, discussions on Hinduism to the more prosaic, banal discussions on prime time television. But thank you all very much. I think Shashi Tharoor deserves a huge <laughs> round of and I'm glad he's written this book because I think it was necessary to write a book to challenge in a way the kind of politics more than anything else that has been used in the name of religion. Thank you very much once again to this wonderful audience. Thank you. And I'm glad that we are doing this uh, at the Nehru Memorial because there is the portrait of someone in a sense who reflected on another form of nationalism. Thank you. Thank you.